up, everybody? This is Joshua Thomas Gray here with another episode of We Are Human. Today, I'm so, so excited. This is going to be mind-blowing, guys. It's going to be informative. It's going to be inspiring. It's going to be everything. It ticks every single box. I'm here with London Fletcher. She's a seventh grade uh, student in Blaine, um, and she's an orca whale research assistant for the Orca Research Trust. She just got back from Barcelona. She does legit stuff, guys. I'm very excited to get into this. However, as always, we're going to start way back. Well, not really way back because you're only a seventh grader. So this <laughs> is not going as far back as normal. But um, we like to like start where you were born, what childhood was like, and all that. This is going to go pretty quick, though, because you kind of jumped into this when you were like seven right yeah 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 six seven I don't know. numbers are blurred now <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> but yeah i was born in washington state in bellevue uh i've lived in blaine for my whole life tiny town by the border uh i i had a pretty typical childhood i don't it wasn't super like extraordinary i was regular little kid i uh since i was long as i can remember i had an interest in the ocean and marine sciences and stuff like that and my fascination with orcas it began i think i was about six when a documentary called blackfish aired on cnn and i was i thought it was really cool because i didn't watch any of the previews i just saw it and the attention-grabbing killer whale. And I was like, I like killer whales, let's watch it! Uh, and it was really dark. Uh, Dude, for real, for a yeah, six-year-old. But it was just so mind-blowing because like, you're taught to believe that the... It's about the captive killer whales at SeaWorld and revealing the truth of how they're treated and what goes on behind the scenes that we're not seeing. And it's really dark and kind of graphic it's yeah just really like touching and emotional because you don't know that how badly the whales are being treated at sea world you don't we're taught to believe they're not doing this because they have to they're doing it because they want to right well if they want to survive they're gonna have to yeah and that film starts right here in our backyard yeah. like right in the islands here the san juan islands yeah. which you grew up in blaine <laughs> so it's like Really, You're really right close. on the ocean and yeah. very close um, to these islands. Yeah, it's, it's like an hour and 30 minute boat ride. Yeah. Was it, though, like being only six, like I can barely remember things when I was like five and six. You remember this very clearly, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Did Pretty it clearly. seem like, oh, man, am I too young to be watching a documentary like this? Uh, a little, but n not really, because my parents, they, uh, like, I was watching, like, nature documentaries and stuff, yeah. like, David Edinburgh, like, Blue Planet-esque stuff, so right. I was watching adult programming. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, like, nature but, stuff. Yeah, nature stuff. Like, so, Nat Geo and yeah. that kind of stuff. But, I don't know, it never really occurred to me that I was too young to do anything, because my parents, they were really awesome, and they told me that I could do whatever I want <laughs> so right uh -huh. and w so you had a love for animals before watching that yeah you were watching a lot of these kind of like documentary or like tv shows and yeah. whatnot what did that look like and how how young do you remember because like I said I vaguely remember things even when I was five or six um, I vaguely remember up to like yeah, three four really and at that but point, like very vaguely. Yeah, yeah. So, do you remember like having a love for animals? Yeah, I always. What did that look like? Well, it was just like a fascination with animals because it's it's so they're so crazy and fascinating and interesting. And I knew when I was really little that I wanted to do something with animals because well, why wouldn't you? It's yeah, so cool. So, I mean remember that and then it's just so heartbreaking because seeing that somebody would purposefully like mistreat something so magnificent and beautiful it's sad yeah and you, before even watching that documentary did you have that feeling or 
pre seeing that, was that kind of the first time that you realized like, oh, wow, humans like sometimes really mistreat animals? Yeah, that was. That was kind of the first time of, s- of witnessing that. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So before that, were you mostly interested in marine animals or was it? Yeah, I thought, yeah, marine, but like all, I thought all animals were really interesting, but yeah, mostly marine mammals because yeah. marine animals, because the ocean's you know, right there. Right. It's so close to, why wouldn't you be interested in something in your backyard? Yeah. Would you then, is this, would you go out on a boat when you were little? Did you guys have a boat growing no. up? No. No. So you would like go to the beach and yeah, collect rocks and look at whatever is on yeah. the beach. Yeah, basically. Nice. And then, so, I mean, I guess let's like, before we get into it, because we basically are there at this point in your life, which is crazy, but pre that, so like saying that you had a normal growing up situation, like mom and dad, small town, like yeah. all of that was normal, though, yep. was at a young age, did your parents start kind of noticing that? maybe you were excelling and learning and that kind of stuff already? I don't know. I, mean, I probably. I don't know. Really but you, know. you don't know. You're just yeah. a kid. Yeah. Like, what were you into? Uh, Other than obviously animals, but like. I don't know. They they commented that I was like a really well-behaved child. You okay. Know? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's true, but uh, I was... It was like animals and reading. That was basically it. I would just, you know, hold myself into my room and like books. I need to intake books at an incredibly fast rate. Uh, when you were like five and six uh, or like, a little bit after that? Like five, six. Yeah. What kind of books were you reading? Nothing super advanced, but I do remember there was a, uh, so there was this one book and it was like that I got at the public library and it was about like fish and whales and seals and stuff and I remember that I would just sit on my bed and read that book over and over and over again because I thought it was the most interesting coolest thing so I was like I want to work I want to work in an aquarium nice (laughs) so of course I don't yeah I want to be a scientist now but so I kind of had that instilled in me when I was really little but right so you still read a lot, I'm assuming. Yeah. What kind of stuff are you reading now? Uh, you know, novels and scientific papers occasionally. Yeah. But, yeah. What was, like, your favorite book that you read in the last year or so? Oh, well, that's difficult. Uh, my favorite books are probably the, the Hobbit series. Nice. Uh, Lord of the Rings are really good books. When was the first time you read through that? Like fifth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Like you read? The, did you read the Hobbit first and then the trilogy, yeah. Lord of uh-huh. the Rings? Yeah. In the fifth grade. Uh huh. So I read the whole Narnia ago. Chronicles in the first grade. Nice. You like Lord of the Rings more? Yes. <laughs> have you seen the movies? Yeah, I have. You like the book more? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the books are always better. <laughs> yeah. What is? Who's like your favorite character? In the, like the Lord of the Rings, it's got to be Gandalf. I'm yeah. sorry, Gandalf <laughs> top tier. Yeah, Gandalf wins. Yes, that's true. Like, who is better than Gandalf? If you really think about it, it can't be. Yeah, it's definitely Gandalf. He can just do whatever the heck he wants. Yeah, man. Okay, so um, back trailing a little bit, you saw that film. Did you, like, were you crying? Yes, there was a lot of crying from Walk everybody me... in the house. Okay, so paint the picture of what that day, because that was a pretty life-altering moment. Yeah. For your whole family. Because, so, we had been seeing, like, uh, commercials on CNN because, you know, we were, like, watching the news channel, right? And so we kept seeing commercials for this this documentary about killer whales and everybody especially my dad he had love of killer whales so we were like oh we gotta watch this right it looks so cool uh and so one night we finally sat down and watched it and it was just so 
I can't completely paint, but everybody was just kind of sitting there with, like, mouth agape. Like, how could somebody think this is okay? Yeah. So, I, like, just weeping through the whole thing? Basically, or? yeah, because there's so many just awful, awful things that... Yeah. The treatment of the whales that, uh... The deaths of trainers, because... You right. know, because of whales. like, And that only happens in captivity, too. People, Killer whales, they aren't aggressive in the wild. Right. But you would be you would be aggressive, too, if you were trapped in a bathtub right. for your entire life. Yeah. Exactly. And it was just, like, there are stories of them just separating moms and babies and the mom just crying and crying and crying, right? Yeah. It's just, who could ever think that was okay? Yeah. So then after it was finished, did you guys, like, have a family meeting and be like, I don't... whoa, this was a lot? What is everybody thinking and feeling? Or what happened I after? I don't... I don't really remember, but it was just... I know it was kind of just sitting there like, whoa. Yeah. It was kind of just stunned and then processing. Yeah. yeah. Do you re- remember after that being like, I want to do something? Yeah. Was and that we, pretty instantaneous? Yeah. And we ha- we had a friend, and so she uh, she was involved with the cause before we were. And so she uh, told us, oh, there's a screening of it at, uh, at Edmonds Community College. And somebody who's in the movie, like the people who are in the documentary are going to be there. So my mom and I drove up and we went and saw it and that was actually how I got invested in the Southern Residence, the killer whales that we have in Washington. Because I met uh, an amazing person, a really good friend of ours now, uh, Howard Garrett. He's been fighting for this cause and for the Southern Residence for years. Uh, so he, I was like, you know, this big, there's some yeah. picture somewhere of me and him standing uh, yeah. together. And so he gave me all this information about the killer whales and how I could get involved. And it was, it was really amazing. So I went through and I read all that. And so I thought, basically at that time, I'm going to do whatever I can in my power, even if it's not a lot, to try and save these animals. Because it was just so... To me, it felt like, how could you know about this and then just not do something? Right. You know, and there's people, like some like a former friend of uh, ours, we told them to watch it because they were huge SeaWorld fanatics. They would go every year. Yeah. You know, and so we told them, hey, watch this. And they were like, oh, that's really sad, but meh. Right. And still... Going to see world and stuff. Yep. Right. So when you went to that and met those people, um, what was like one of the first steps that you took to do something? And through that, did you ever think like, maybe I'm too young to do this? Or how much did your parents um, instill in you that it doesn't matter that you're young, like you can do things about this? Yeah, it was, it was a lot of, it doesn't matter how old you are, Ed, nobody's too young to make a difference. Uh, the first thing I did was I wanted to tell, you know, it's a small thing. I made a, uh, like this whole, like, poster report, and I presented it to my first grade class about, hey, this what's happening. And it was about the, uh, the killer whales that we have here and captive killer whales. So yeah. there's two egotypes of orca here. So egotypes are genetically separate populations, so... They're both orca, but they're completely different, you know, separated genetically. And so there's the southern resident killer whales who uh, are critically endangered, so there's only 73 of them left. And then there's the transient or big killer whales who they're a lot bigger. They eat seals, unlike the southern residents who eat salmon, uh, and they're currently thriving. So a lot of people actually don't even know that. Yeah, I didn't know that there were two different types. Also, how many... There's 73 right now, you said, the Southern residents. Yeah. How many were there a few, like, and at what date? Uh, well, in the 1990s, they almost hit 100. 
because so they were critically endangered due to the fact that there was so back in the 60s and 70s uh people were capturing killer whales and putting them in marine parks zoos aquariums because it was such a cool thing it was like whoa this giant animal we can make a lot of money off this yeah and so their population was decimated by that how many do we know we don't know there's estimates in the like the hundreds 200s of orcas that were taken out here oh that were taken out Ooh, probably like no over 60 i think at least because there was the uh the biggest capture in i forget what year but in pen cove on woodby island so it's this huge protected bay yeah and so they were rounding up killer whales with you know bombs like because it was really loud and they're so sound dependent right uh that they were just rounding them up and into this little group and put a net on them uh a lot of them died yeah and so to hide it they would pull up the babies fill them with rocks sink them they took only a f- like a f- dozen or two uh, of so them. They ended of the up... sixty taken, actually survived. Gotcha. And so... now only one of those whales that was taken is alive. Right. Yeah. Dang. She's still in a marine park. Her name's Lolita or Tokite. There's two names for her. There's her, you know, native given name, and then the her marine park given name. Yeah, so. and where is she? She's at the Miami Seaquarium, and so she's been there for almost 50 years. I think we're coming up on 50 years this year, and she's been all alone for a while. She used to have a partner, but he uh, died of blunt force trauma to the head because one day, he his name was Hugo, and so he just decided to ram his head repeatedly into the wall, and he killed himself. Wow. At that park? Mm-hmm. Crazy. Now she's alone. She doesn't have any killer whale company. She performs with a few dolphins. And she's in... How is the relationship of an orca with dolphins? Uh, they're just kind of harassing her, basically. Right. You know, they're, they outnumber her, and she's like... Ah. Right. So, <clears throat> so, like, as a first grader, you put together that presentation. Yeah. And that was kind of like your first time in front of people and advocating to a group do you remember that moment do you remember feeling like wow this is meaningful and i want to keep doing this yeah and i was i was really proud that i was able to put something like that together and that i could possibly change the viewpoints of at least a few people because even if you only you know change one person that's still one more person for the cause yeah, Every, exactly. Everybody matters. Right. And the ripple effect of that one person can yeah. be a lot. That's amazing. So as a first grader, you understood that. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. And are you realizing how much of that is because you have parents who are so supportive? Yeah. I and believe in it? I wouldn't be able to do it without them, really. Right. They're, they've always been so supportive of you know, everything I'm doing, and they never belittled me for yes. for wanting to do this. They were always so supportive, you know, taking me all of these places, travel around the world, and I know it's not cheap, so right. I really appreciate them. Yeah, that's amazing. So after that, what kind of kept happening then? Or before we go on, how many of the kids from the class afterwards, like, talked to you about that after? And were like, wow, that's, like, did you get much feedback a little bit of feedback yeah Yeah. nothing like that stood out no but uh i after that i was i wanted to learn more and more about this the cause so i could you know educate more people so i went to uh symposiums and lectures and took notes and traveled all around washington at any point did it did you ever have the feeling that other adults like when you would go to these and listen to lectures that they were kind of like what is this little girl doing yes. here like and yeah maybe you should just go back to school and like do yep. little girl things yeah <laughs> there uh so there was i forget what it was but uh so my dad called the woman and asked hey can she intern here she's only 
nine, I think I was at the time. And so she told, she basically told my dad, oh, well, she can go play in the tide pools. Right. <laughs> Which, though, understandably. Yeah. Do you right. understand that that... It's I a get common, that's yeah. not great because they're It's a common because a lot of people are like, oh, my kid's so super gifted. And right. So she might have gotten that a lot, so... Right. And so... That, though, also is this other thing of, like, that it is so strong in your parents' parenting of not just being like, oh, I guess this isn't going to work out. Yeah. Like, they also advocated for you yeah, to not just, when a door was shut, not be like, oh, sorry, London, like, we tried. Maybe we'll yeah. just have to wait. Yeah, we're all very stubborn in our household. <laughs> <laughs> So, some no's don't don't fly. So, what yeah. did that look like? You called that person there, said that. So then, what was that kind of like? Did that hurt a little bit? The first a little, but it also made me motivated to a sort of like I'm gonna show them. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and so there was there's a uh, conference, a r- pretty large one, uh, on San Juan Island called Superpod. So it's called Superpod. Because it happens in the critical core summer habitat of the Southern Residence. So that's basically where they spend the majority of their time. That's an important place for them. So, and when all three pods get together, because there's three sort of families or clans within the population. So there's J pod, K pod, and L pod. And so when all three of them meet together in a huge group, that's called a super pod. So, nice. conference is called super pod. And so there's a lot of pretty world-renowned killer whale scientist there. One of them was my hero and now dear friend, uh, Dr. Ingrid Visser. So she is the only person to swim with killer whales for science. She's been doing it for years and years now. She's highly respected in the field, and I just thought she was the coolest person. And I was like, I want to do that when I grow up. Yeah. And so I met her there. And so, so surreal. I was like, whoa, it's crazy. And then the next year I went. And so I was, so after going to more symposiums, I think I was, you know, eight at the time. And so there's a panel every year called the Scholarly Advocacy Panel. So young people, students uh, advocating for killer whales, captive and wild. And so there's a panel afterwards. And so I asked, basically, I want to do something and make a difference, but nobody's giving me an opportunity. They say that I'm too young. And to that, she replied, and I'll never forget this. She said, well, you're not too young to come down and intern with me in New Zealand. And that's mind-blowing. There are adults who are like, I, I want to intern. Please give me the opportunity to intern. Right. It's just a crazy, surreal experience that somebody was finally you know, giving me an opportunity. Yeah, and that was a year after the first time you met her. Yeah. At the first time you met her, did you guys stay in contact at all? Uh, not not really. It was more just like, hi, nice to meet you, and yeah. this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, blah, 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 and then kind of nothing until the next year. Yeah. And then you guys got to talk more, and then yeah. she said that, and yeah. she meant it. Uh huh. You went to New Zealand. Yeah, when I was nine in August, I went to New Zealand and interned with her, and it was a lot of work. Yeah, like you did a real legit internship yeah. like, that probably no nine year old has ever done. Yeah, I was actually the uh, I'm the youngest person to get a internship for cytology in the world. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you know this. <laughs> yeah, and so when when she said that to you. <laughs> Was there just a a massive feeling of, like, gratitude yeah. that an adult, and especially somebody that you admired and looked up to, would say something like that to you and meant it to the point of, like, you went, and then she didn't put you in the little pond to just touch little things. Like, she put you to real work. Yeah. How much of that do you think... It, was that kind of the biggest thing that has like shaped yeah. all the work that you've done because it was 
it gave me so much credibility after that because I could say, oh, I interned with Dr. Ringard Visser. Uh, and it was, like my dad said, a cosign on my ability. And it was just so crazy. Yeah. How did she, what did she see in you? Have you talked with her about that? Like, have you asked her like, hey, why did you believe in me? And why did you have me come do that? Uh, I didn't really ask her, but she's, uh, she says that when she picks people to intern with her, that she looks for people who aren't, she calls it me-itis, me, 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 I, 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 I want to do this and I want to swim with killer whales and I, it's not, what can I do for the center? What can I do for the whales? What can I do for you? It's, so I think she just, she saw saw that that you were very selfless in this pursuit. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And then she's become a mentor to you. Yeah. Ever since then, right? Yeah. Did you guys kind of just hit it off when... So hanging out with her, was that like the first time when you went to New Zealand? And how much time did you actually get to spend with her? Oh, well, spend the whole time with her. Okay. Uh, it was three weeks, so 21 days. Uh, so I was with her the whole time, you know, going places, talking to... Talking to organizations to get funding for her. Uh, you were doing yeah. talks, or you were there, there kind of, kind of assisting. Yeah, going to schools and stuff. Yeah, did she kind of just like take you under her wing? Yeah, like very much so. Yeah, and did you guys just hit it off? Yeah. Was it cool to? A lot of people experience like the opposite. They look up to somebody, and then they meet them in real life, and it's kind of like meh, like not what they were hoping and what they had up in their mind of this person that they look up to so much. Yeah, no, But it sounds like she is maybe more than what you had even yeah. had in your mind. How crazy has that been? Pretty wild. Because now it's been how long? Oh, uh, three years? Yeah, three. Yeah, so three years. And how often are you guys in communication well we're in communication a lot because i help her with projects stuff that she needs me to do uh so there's it's a lot of work yeah so uh but i don't get to see her very often right because we live on the opposite side of the world because she so. lives in new zealand uh-huh yeah but she's traveling everywhere for court cases trying to help captive whales so she is that woman doesn't sleep. Yeah. She's always working. It's crazy. Sometimes you got to be like, hey, you need to get rest. And she's like, no, I got to gotta do this. Yeah. She was the hardest worker I have ever met. Wow. That's amazing. How crazy. Yeah. Um, okay. So how does all of this work as an elementary school student that lives in a small town? And now a middle school student, like, how has this functioned? Like, how are you going to these places and doing this work? And then just like, you go to school. And is it sometimes like just not very interesting to be learning about yeah, some of the things that you're learning at school? A lot of it is, I don't want to like boast or anything, but it's stuff I already know. I'm starting to get more challenged in school now because... My school is really, really understanding, and they they try to do their best to challenge me. And But for a while, it was just sitting there like, oh, I already know all of this. Uh, it's right. so easy. Because I guess we haven't determined, like, your, like, reading and writing and math and science, all of that is of, like, a much higher grade yeah. than what grade you're in. It, even in when you were in elementary school. I mean, you were reading like full chapter books and things like this. Like yeah. other kids aren't doing that. And how long was it until the school actually took it serious that, okay, maybe London is actually just w- way more advanced on these things and we need to try to work with them on challenging you? It was like third, fourth grade because I had really amazing teachers who understood that I need to be challenged. Yeah. And so they were catering things for me, like harder math, like above my grade level, harder reading, stuff like that. Yeah. So I have, our school's been really good about working 
with my parents and me and finding ways to cater stuff to me. Yeah. How do you like going to public school? Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite subjects in school? Oh, it's got to be math, math or math. science. Because the nice thing about math is that it's concrete. There's an answer and there's a formula. And it's not like, well, this is my opinion. That's the same right. with science. It's data and evidence, and I like that a lot. Right. But math is even more so. Yeah. Science can even start getting, like, debatable. Uh, yeah. Because people will use different data and say that that's what they believe and it's like well yeah. and they can kind of skew things a little bit where math yeah. it's just like is legitimately just the numbers yeah the answer <laughs> it, is it the just, answer that is what the number is yeah. there is no other thing that's super interesting so what does what does like a normal day at school look like for you like are you do you hang out with friends yeah. What do you do for recess time? Well, we don't we don't have that anymore. They just What? Yeah. They Wait, you don't get... have recess? No. We just What took... grade are you in? Seventh. They took recess away from seventh graders? Yes. <laughs> oh uh, my gosh. Wait, what year did you stop having uh sixth grade? I'm so confused right now. Why would they not have so wait what time do you go to school then i get i go to school at uh 8 20 and then because i am band geek so on tuesdays and thursdays i go to jazz band stage band and nice. so wait, that's really early in the morning i play tuba and baritone so nice. baritone's like a small tuba yeah uh so wake up early for that that's uh, pre-school starting uh-huh go and then that. school starts at 8 20 and so band is my first class I go to uh, language arts and social studies, so it's a pretty easy class for me. And then yeah. it's science next, so I do pretty well in science because a lot of stuff is like writing reports and making con drawing conclusions from experiments and stuff, so I do pretty good at that. And then we, uh, we have this thing called advisory, so uh, for other kids it's like a time to get caught up on schoolwork, check your grades, make sure that you're getting organized. But for me and a few other people, uh, because I ran for a uh, for school uh, ASB, so like student body president, vice president, right? I didn't make. Oh, oops. Uh, I didn't make it, but still, we were put in a uh, a special class, so where we can do stuff around the school, organize events and things like that for our school fundraisers. So that's yeah. pretty nice to be able to give back to my school they've done a lot for me and uh after that is lunch so i hang out with my friends a lot of my friends are in well they're like eighth grade so they're older than me and are they uh, in band with or the like jazz band and stuff yeah is where you probably get to spend time with kids who are in older grades than you right yeah yeah so i'm gonna hang out with them and then uh there's an advanced math class so we're doing uh, eighth grade plus math in there because our school has a program called highly capable so we were tested on that when we were younger and the school saw that we were you know smart so there's not a lot of people in that class there's like 15 kids okay and so we're all doing advanced math we're ahead of everybody else in our grade so is that all your grade kids or is yeah. it different grades all in a higher no math class? it's uh it's our grade gotcha. it's just seventh grade so but we're doing more advanced math so we're going to be taking algebra and high school math in uh when we're in eighth grade nice is and that is that has that been nice getting to yes. advance in math faster As now because i can finally go at my own pace right so that's really nice and then what time is school done school ends at 250 and then after that, I'm going to be doing, I do cheer, and I'm going to be doing some other sports. I'm going to be doing soccer. So Nice. Have you done soccer before? Yeah, I've done it since I was really little because okay. my dad's the high school soccer coach. Nice. Awesome. I'm actually now trying to think maybe I'm overreacting here. I don't think I had recess by seventh grade. I guess that's normal. I think yeah. sixth grade was the last time. Yeah. And then it gets cut off. You're too old to have fun. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, wait, so then how's soccer going? When well, it hasn't is started. The... the season starts in, uh, I think it starts in May. April and May. April, May, you'll start. I think, yeah. Through, is this though now Slender. you'll be playing for Blaine? Yeah. Is that the first time that you'll be playing for Blaine school? Yeah. Yeah. Are you excited for that? Yeah. What is, how is that going to, that'll be like a lot different, isn't it? Well, yeah, because we're actually going to be traveling to other schools and stuff. Right. You know, our school, uh, I would say Blaine is very good at sports except like wrestling. Yeah. Uh, you know, girls soccer and baseball are undefeated. Uh, for, Wait, we've been girls undefeated. soccer is We've good. been on, un- yeah. Nice. We've been uh, undefeated for the last few years. Nice. For middle school soccer. So, but the, the high school, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, so traveling to other schools, there's a, uh, there's always so much athletic rivalry with other schools. You know, there's right. this one, Blaine, not a very rich school. We're a good community, but our schools not have a lot of money. And then right. we have a rivalry with the really rich school, Linden Christian. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that's, that gets intense, even though they're way better than us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so, um, man, there's so much that we could cover here, but maybe we should kind of jump into like orca whales yeah, and explain kind of the wholeness of this. Cause a lot of people really know nothing about orca whales. The only reason I know some is because I've hung out with you guys a little bit. So like I... I kind of learned a bit more. Do you want me to explain about like the wild whales and stuff? Um, yeah. Let's like get yeah, so like it... kind of orcas in general, but then the orcas that live here as right. well. Yeah, so I'll just I'm not an expert on orcas as a whole, but I am. I'm pretty knowledgeable about the whales here. So yeah. So the southern resident killer whales or SRKW, uh, they're a they're species that inhabits, so they go, they've been seen to go up to Alaska and down to California, but they mainly stay in Washington, on the outer coast of Washington. Uh, during the summertime, is the San Juan Islands are their core critical summer habitat, so they're spending a majority of their time there, or they should be, but they're, we're not seeing that that much anymore, and that's because these whales are literally starving to death. So, the Columbia and Snake River... So where they meet, that was the the largest producer of salmon in North America. So southern resident killer whales, they eat salmon and mainly Chinook salmon. About 80% of their diet is Chinook salmon because it's a uh, very large, fatty, rich fish. So it's nourishing for them. And so for a very, very long time, this, was the, this river was the largest producer of salmon. Uh, and then in the 50s and 60s, four dams were built for hydroelectric power on the river so the four lower snake river dams uh and so because of that we're seeing increased salmon mortality like smolts and we're not seeing as many return and so these dams they are literally killing their main prey source so without their main prey item what are they gonna do they're starving so yeah they're we are witnessing extinction <laughs> what has caused since the 50s to current because it seems like it just really ramped up the last couple years where the salmon just are like becoming almost non-existent yeah. what happened in the last like five years as opposed to the last 50 well i can't i'm not an expert on that yeah. so but it's just it's a build-up over time right, right. so the it dams started compounding yeah these dams they're they create huge reservoirs so just still water that's and it gets really hot in the daytime and yeah. it's too hot for salmon so people are oh, there's a lot of people studying the impacts of climate change on salmon and so basically it gets too hot for the smolts to survive so they die right, right. and then going under the dams there's a turbine uh because not all, because uh and so the smolts, a lot of them die in there. They spent, I believe, a billion dollars trying to replace the turbines to make them uh, more fish-friendly. Right. 
<laughs> and that basically did nothing. Uh, and one argument for keeping the dams is they provide electricity in the when we need it the most, like at hospitals during a power outage. Well, right. that's not true. They uh, the power is being sold for surplus. Uh, it's not necessary if we uh breach them. So got rid of them. Right. Wouldn't even be a blip on the power grid. So yeah. they don't produce uh they're they're not making enough money to even cover their own running costs. So Bonneville Power, that's the company that owns the dams. Yeah. They're going broke. Right. And so at some points of the day, this is very rarely, you know, maybe only happens like a few months, uh, during the peak points of the day, they will sometimes be paying people like, please take this electricity. <sighs> we yeah. very rarely see that, but still it's yeah like they're pretty obsolete yeah but with the new power alternatives like but, solar wind yeah but the to get rid of them people are afraid of what well uh in the eastern portion of the state where the dams are located there's a uh sort of attachment to the dams uh and so a lot of people there they're like, this is our livelihood. This is, we need them. And so our uh, politicians are too afraid to speak out on that because if they do and they say, we want to get rid of the dams, they lose a majority of their following in the eastern portion of the state. Because, right. Right. And you've done quite a bit. Yeah. Advocating and writing and maybe talk a little bit about what things you have done with yeah. our politicians in trying to educate them. So, uh, every, you know, every now and then there will be a, like a mass sending of postcards and letters to Governor Jay Inslee and Senator Patty Murray, uh, just saying breach the dance and, uh, or like mass phone calls. Uh, people organize meetings with the politicians, but a lot of the time it's, it doesn't happen for whatever reason. Right. Which is something but, uh, you've, tried to do right yeah have you ever been able to meet no do you know why they won't meet with you um you know i'm not really sure some it's uh sometimes i get like replaced by other people like adults they're like hey well this, there's this fish biologist and so okay it's like oh we can only have this many people can london get out of here yeah. uh are you still writing and trying to meet with her yeah, uh, we. Uh, my dad has uh, published ads in the Seattle Times. Yeah, about the Southern residents. I've done a lot of public speaking. Uh, one of them was actually at the uh, on the steps of the uh, the office in Olympia. Yeah. So it's it's just a matter of actually getting the meetings because. But that's really, really difficult, right? So. Right. Okay, so going back to the dams, um, they are still there. Yep. They're potentially not going away Yeah. anytime soon. Basically. So where does that now take us? What do you mean? Moving forward, currently, uh, right now, like the salmon, there's not enough. The orcas don't have enough to eat. How many now have starved? Like, and actually died? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but like, I can't say the exact number, but like 20 ish. Yeah. Or more. And before that, well, it's hard too, though, because when did people start really like studying? the orca whales out here uh the 70s so we really only have like data since the 70s but there are people have said that they are the most studied killer whale population in the world okay so we know a lot about them and we know what the issue is but it's just people are hesitant to say anything about it because you know it's such a it feels like it's issue. a political issue to it people. really is yeah at this point right and so um, maybe talk through the different pods and when they all come together and what they normally do the, since the 70s when they've been studying them and now kind of the weird things that they've been doing recently. 
Yeah, so there's L-Pod. L-Pod is the biggest pod out of them. I think there's, you know, 40-something whales. Uh, 30, 40. Uh, so they, they stay here for about the second longest, and then they go up to, uh, to British Columbia, and occasionally they go down to California. And then there's J-Pod, which is they, uh, they've lost the most, uh, whales recently because they spend the most time in Washington. They'll stay here even when there isn't fish. So, because they're like, this is, you know, like, more or less, like, this is our home. It's our habitat. Right. So, they will stay here for longer than they should. And then there's K-Pod, which is the smallest pod, and nobody really ever knows what K-Pod is doing, because we rarely ever see them, and then we see them for a day, and then, oh, they've left Puget Sound. <laughs> How many are in K-Pod? Uh, last time I checked, there was 18. Okay. Is it? Does it kind of feel like they all have their own, like, personalities and, like, their their own tribes, yeah. basically, and do and things different from each other? Yeah. Uh, J-Pod's a little more playful. Uh, and they all have a distinct dialect, so set of calls. So K-Pod, their calls sound like uh, kittens. It's really cute. It sounds like a little mewing kitten. Really? Yeah. Uh, and then... So they're pretty distinct, and then they have a shared dialect that they use when they get together. Can you explain that, that meetup when they all come together? Yeah, and so when it's, that happens? it's called a super pod, and so with the pods, they line up. And if you put a hydrophone in the water, like it's deathly silent. And then we don't know what happens or what causes this, but then all of a sudden, it's like switches turn, and then they're like breaching. It's playful. It's There's... uh. And you put the hydrophone in the water, and it's, like, loud. Like, so much noise. They're just talk- talking, right? Mm. Right. And that's, like, 80 orca whales. 73, but... <laughs> yeah, It but used like to be, lot. like... N- there used to be uh, 98, I believe. And that was in the, uh, the 80s. Yeah. 80s, 90s. Have you ever seen that happen? I haven't. I want to, you but it's see, kind yeah. of... The prospects are looking low. They don't do that as much anymore, because they are all other places looking for food and they used to do this every year well they still do it every year but it's just not as common right was it before something that was pretty predictable kind of happened at the same place around the same Uh, time and it was like okay we know about when this is gonna happen well not when but you know about where like san juan island that whole archipelago right around there because that's that's their home so. Right, and that so the three different groups come together, and they like look at each other. Basically, yeah. For how long? Minutes, like just half silently. an hour. Yep. Oh, for like a half an hour. At like at most. Sometimes they just sit there and yep, they're just looking just at each other. Does anybody have hypotheses of like why this is happening? What I'm sure doing? people do. I haven't heard any. Gotcha, but then just. Out of nowhere, they just all go crazy. Yeah, basically. It's like a family reunion almost. Uh-huh. Yeah, so and crazy. then you can tell who's you know friends with who. The little kids will go off together. The males will go off together. From different the different pods. Yep. They'll all just kind of uh-huh. go hang out with each other. Uh-huh. That's so crazy. Yeah, it's so cool. What about orca whales are you like, what's the, your favorite thing about orca whales? They're just such a, you know, charismatic species. It's And they're so smart. It's, it's crazy to think that. Yeah. Like, what do you... Like, do you think whales and stuff haven't been um, researched and talked about as much because they live in the ocean? Yeah. And technology is just getting to the point where it makes it easier for us to study these animals as opposed to land animals yeah. which humans have interacted with for so long but it's like it would be so difficult especially in cold water like even a hundred years ago that would be really difficult plus like yeah. what there was no like real good technology to do anything with it so do you think that is maybe why we don't know as much about or seem to care as much about yeah because because the ocean feels like a different planet yeah. Right? We know more about the surface of Mars than we do the bottom of the ocean. Which is crazy, right? Yeah. Like, why? 
there's way more we could learn in the ocean, right? Yeah. That could be beneficial to humans, even. Yeah. So I don't understand. How come, what do you think is the reason for this disconnect of something that's like right there? Well, it's such a foreign thing because you look at like an octopus and you're like, that's, a, that's an alien. It's Yeah. It's just there's a sort of disconnect. Right. And, you know, people aren't like seeing these every day in their normal life. So it's like, well, why should I care? It's... But at the same time, we're not seeing space and i mean i guess we are you look up and you see the stars yeah so i guess everybody does see that so maybe that makes people feel more connected and want to explore space yeah more so than the ocean also the bottom of the ocean you know it's so difficult and expensive to get right to study things underwater because the whales spend this much of their lives like where, where we can see them right how far are these orca whales going? And how deep do they go? Oh, like several hundred, several hundred yards or Down. deeper. Yeah. yeah. And they're really unpredictable because you can go out there. Like me and my dad have gone out there for hours and not seen anything. Just get completely skunked. Yeah. They're smart. So if they want to lose you. Yeah. They're gone, saying you don't know where they've gone. Yeah. But then a lot of times they seem, uh, maybe these words are not the correct way to say it, but they seem curious and they will yeah. come around people in boats and stuff yeah, all the time. That's a good word. We've all seen the videos that go viral on the internet. Yeah. Orca's just like coming right up to people and yeah. they seem almost interested. Yeah. And not like afraid of being around people or anything like that. Yeah. Is that, am I taking liberty in thinking those things? No, I'm, that's a fair assumption. I mean, I think that too, you know, because yeah. they're so intelligent. Right. Like, do you, you maybe talk about the intelligence of them and kind of like their language? Is that a correct yeah, terminology? Dialect. dialect. It's not considered a language, even though it basically is. Uh but yeah, so they uh, actually have a, uh, their brain is more developed than ours. So the part that focuses on empathy and emotions, that is more developed than a human brain. And how is that different from lots of other species and animals? Well, Do some animals not even have that part of the brain? A lot of animals have that part of the brain, but it's, but it's you know, not. Not even to close to as developed as a human part of the brain yeah then the orcas it's more more developed so why would they have that if you know they weren't if they couldn't feel them why would they have a more developed part of the brain for you know empathy and emotions right they have such close family bonds and they'll stay with their mother for their entire life yeah and then what about like how they communicate to each other yeah so they have a dialect uh that consists of clicks and whistles so each one actual need. whistles well it's like ee, you know that's... i mean they're not whistling yeah you can't really whistle under <laughs> yeah but but it sounds like that yeah so it's it's that's what it's yeah referred to as clicks and whistles mm-hmm. and so each there are a lot of recorded ones and each of them seem to have different meanings we don't know what those are yet that's actually what i would like to do to go into is the acoustics right for whales and do you now, I mean, we can get out of like what's scientific and hard evidence and more into like ideas and thoughts, yeah. but like, do you think that whales have full on languages more complex than any or most other animal species and potentially as sophisticated as like human language? I, well, you're not really supposed to say this. You're like, oh, it's just a stupid animal. But right. I'm not sure if it's more complex or as complex as humans, but they definitely do have a language, right? Right. But if we're comparing it to like a dog that can uh, like... Yeah. Probably more developed than that because, you know, dogs say it's body language. Right. That's how they communicate, but... Where the orc is actually will yeah. make a noise that is basically a word that means something. 
Yeah, basically. Right. Do you think, though, it's like something that we as humans could start actually learning? Possibly. Yeah. Is that what you would hope to do yeah, at some point? Yeah. I just find it like super interesting and wonder, like, obviously these are things that we can't know. Nobody knows these answers of questions of like the language of whales and stuff. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. And so I think it would it would just be so cool to see that kind of happen in yeah. the future. But um, yeah, we can kind of switch here and talk about like your last trip that you just got uh-huh. back from in Barcelona. Okay. What were you doing in Barcelona? All right. <laughs> so I was in Barcelona for this humongous worldwide conference called the World Marine Mammal Conference. So that was hosted in Spain this year. The location changes every time it's hosted. But I was presenting on a uh, on my own research paper on the Southern Resident Killer Whales. So it was uh, an update on the status of them and the issues that they're suffering from and what we can do to help them or what is a, the fastest solution. Yeah. Do you want to hear my abstract? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so as a 12-year-old with a keen eye to the planet's future, I've become involved in a flagship environmental issue for the region in which I live, Southern Resident Killer Whales, or the SRKW. Here, we review the status of this endangered population. The current estimate of abundance for SRKW is 73 animals in three pods, down from 96 in 1995. Reproduction is low, with only six six calves born since 2015. 42% of neonates do not... So neonates, like a fetus or small child, uh, of neonates do not survive the first few critical years of life. We have since estimated that pregnancy loss rate in utero is close to 70%. So that means 70% of calves that are conceived aren't being born. They're dying before they're even born. Also, recent aerial photogram... Photogrammetric images have shown that the body condition of some individuals is poor and indicative of nutritional stress. Various factors have been invoked to explain the decline in SRKW, including pollution, noise, harassment from whale watching vessels, and insufficient prey. Of these, the lack of prey is widely regarded as the main factor affecting recovery. SRKW preferentially target fat rich Chinook salmon the abundance of which has declined in large part because of anthropogenic degradation of habitats. That's basically uh, stuff that humans are doing to degrade their habitat. So, you know, dams, fishing, stuff like that. Uh, In Puget Sound, only 22 of at least 37 historic Chinook runs remain. The remaining wild Chinook salmon are at 10% of historic numbers. The single most effective conservation action to assist SRKW would be, breach- would be the breaching of the four dams on the Snake River to restore free passage of spawning and juvenile salmon. Yet, despite broad agreement on the importance of this, it remains seemingly, seemingly politically impossible. So, but unless salmon populations are restored, the SRKW will likely continue to decline. So this is what you... We're talking about two groups in yeah, Barcelona. So, like adults. So it's a poster. So at conferences like these, there's usually a room. Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. Move that back up. There's usually a room with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people's posters on whatever they're researching all lined up. And so the researcher, the main author, will usually be standing by their poster and taking questions because you know, there's some really interesting topics there, ranging from you know, genetic variability to you know, conservation stuff like I'm doing. So Right. It's a broad range of things. Yeah. Wow. So that's something that you wrote yeah. that took probably a lot of work and yeah. research and time. And you have, um, like, your scientist friends <laughs> that are legit that, like, look over these and help you. Yeah, I'll... Uh... I'll yeah, send them something to edit, and it'll come back, and it'll all just be red yeah. from the the editing pen in Microsoft Word. Right. Yeah. And, and then you're like, all apart. right. So <laughs> yeah, and then back to the red. Edit it, send it back, still all red. Yeah. Wow. So it's how was that? How was it being able to present that after all I that work? I felt really, really proud that I was able to 
get it done and be able to present on it to a group of people. It's yeah. a lot, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Right. That's amazing. So, I mean, we could go on and on and on and talk about so many different things. Yeah. Um, but what is like, how do you balance being a kid and doing something that is, you know, pretty serious? You are passionate about this and yeah. understand that, I mean, this is like serious work to you. But how do you balance that? Well, of course, I'm not doing it 24-7. Right. Right. So I do as much as I can, but I, mean, I still got to make time for school and stuff. So it's actually pretty easy to balance this out because I have a pretty easy time with school. So Right. <laughs> it's not taking much of your time yeah. to finish assignments. Yeah. So, and, you know, it is a little difficult sometimes relating to classmates. Uh, right. Right. Just because, you know, I have such a strong work ethic and, according to others, a strong personality, which I can see. uh, So it's... But I've had a pretty easy time trying to balance it out. Yeah. At school, like, with friends and things, do you find it... Do sometimes you just, like, really want to, like, tell them all of this information? (laughs) Yeah. And then you start realizing, like... Oh, they're not really that interested in. Hearing yeah, my all of friends this. they think it's cool and stuff, but you know they're not super. Like it's not what they're into. Right. It's not like when you go to these conferences and you yeah, can talk to people for hours yeah. about. Because we share these interests, but yeah, I can't expect people at school to be super like, engaged on this because you know we're seventh and eighth graders. Right. <laughs> it's not a normal thing. So. Right. Man. Okay. So, if. Like, what is something that you would really like people to have, like, a takeaway? Like, if you were able to talk to a room of just regular people, like in Bellingham, that don't know anything about the orca whales and what's going on, like, what would you like to let us know? Never, You're never too young or too old to be able to make a difference in your own way. We are all capable of, you know, of making a difference in our own way. Like, of course... You can, uh, like regular people, you can contact your local representatives. So uh, you can email or write a letter or call Governor Jay Inslee or Senator Patty Murray. I always forget the phone numbers, but... Uh, you Google and, it. Yeah, you it. know, uh, for lack of a better word, harass them about this issue. Because the more people they have bugging them, the more they'll understand that, oh, this is an issue that people really care about. There's something that we need to do yeah. and you know james lee kind of did that with the task force and i think that was really great because we haven't been having talks like this in the past decades right it's workers weren't like the forefront so it's good that we're talking but also we need immediate actions that will that will actually make a difference like dam breaching right is there somewhere that people if they want to learn more about that is there like a website or somewhere they could go so you can look on at the Center for Whale Research uh, that's run by Ken Balcom. He's a good friend of ours, and he's been doing this since the 70s. He okay. was, he's been identifying and studying these whales for a really, really long time. So yeah. their site has a lot of good information, and damnsense.org, uh, that has a lot of good information too. So those sites, will you can get really educated on the topic. Right. And anybody can do... It's if a, if if you put your mind to it, you can make a difference. Right. And you not everybody needs to like devote their whole lives to yeah. doing like what you're doing, but if everybody pitches just in. pitches in a little bit to support somebody like you, you don't have to be like save the whales and go to all these things, but yeah. they could learn a little bit about somebody who's doing something and spend a little bit of time understanding it and then do something as simple as writing. Yeah, the more people politician. who the more people who know about it, the better because there's a fundamental lack of awareness in the right. general public about what's going on. A lot of people don't even know. So that's one of the big issues. How are you supposed to care about something if you don't even know about it? Right. Exactly. Oh man. We could go on for another hour. Yeah. But you guys need to go. Is there anything that we I mean, there's a lot of things we didn't cover. But is there anything that comes to mind right now that you would feel would be important to somebody who's listening to know? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to spew all my thoughts out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I think we kind of covered quite a bit. There's so much information There's, about yeah. this that hopefully this is kind of a good generic. And now people can kind of start Googling and yeah. looking up for themselves. Because even yeah. like when I met you guys, I didn't know anything about orca whales. Yeah. And after that, now I just kind of look things up and I'm learning way more than I ever did before. So I think it is, hopefully this is just kind of like a soft little you know nudge of here's all this information some of it's like what i don't understand that <laughs> yeah. at all so now they can kind of like go down that rabbit hole and learn for themselves yeah. all of the stuff but yeah i mean i think that's a great way to end all right and i'm so appreciative that you came here no, i know you just got you back inviting me <laughs> from a big trip and all of that so this is awesome no thanks problem. london yeah. we're out <laughs>